Jeff. Okay, um, so I just wanted to make like two quick remarks about um, why I asked Sean to come and be a part of this series. I think what we're trying to do here is take a really high level look at smart cities, okay? Something that um, there's just been so much hype about in the last couple of years and um, very little kind of long-term thinking. And um, two concepts in particular that have been really hyped almost, you know, like in the last year, the last six months even, uh, have been big data and open data. And Sean is somebody that has been working with big data and open data and really um, you know, transforming uh, the world using those two, those two uh, strategies over the last 10 years. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that he'll be able to give us a really long-term perspective from the inside of, um, as uh, Frank, Frank Hebert from Open Plans said to me the other day, from the coal face, um, what it looks like when you're working with this stuff right up close, um, but having a really um, clear vision of, of what you want to do with it. Um, I first met Sean, I think, probably 12 years ago. Um, we were both uh, part of a handful of urban planners and geographers that were really interested in the infrastructure of the internet. Uh, and that was sort of the first project where Sean took a bunch of open data uh, and aggregated it and created something that a lot of people in government thought was very dangerous and they took away from him um, for a little bit. Hopefully we'll hear about that. But then he went on um, to uh, do some really interesting work um, mapping risks of interdependency between different kinds of infrastructure. So, you know, what happens to telecommunications and banking if you blow up the Holland Tunnel? Um, those kinds of things are, are things that urban planners should be thinking about, uh, but really didn't have the tools until, until he brought this data together. Uh, and then he went on um, to form a company called uh, GeoIQ, which launched a product called GeoCommons, um, which was really trying to become an open mapping repository and toolkit. Um, and then most recently, now is moving on to some humanitarian uh, spatial data mapping work, and I'm sure we'll hear all about that. So um, I'll just hand it over to Sean and, and let him take you through his uh, his last 10, 12 years of working with open data and big data. Well, thanks, Anthony, and, and thanks, everybody, for, for coming out. And, and hopefully can frame this into something interesting. It's, it's kind of quasi-autobiographical, but I think hopefully interesting from the perspective of what happens when your research and your work on data gets trapped in the currents of, of larger macroscopic issues. And it was kind of one of these interesting things where at the university and then once we spun out of the university working on various projects and, and those getting pulled into the larger scope of policy issues and, and technological changes and the uh, juxtaposition of those two things and kind of what the repercussions of that were. So hopefully uh, a little bit of the larger context will keep the uh, the, the coal side of it interesting. Um, uh, but kind of, you know, rolling back, starting, if you kind of roll back to 1999, and I, I think Anthony and I first started uh, collaborating and, and talking about the research we were doing around, you know, 96, 97 or so. Um, but, but what was interesting is what was happening in this kind of time was, was how our perceptions of space were changing. And I don't necessarily, I like the graphic, but I don't mean space as far as outer space, but spaces and spatial and geography, our perceptions of, of distance and location and, and what, it, what it meant. And there was a lot of, during the, the dot-com boom, of prognostications of the death of distance, that you know, as information technologies came on board, that, that you know, whether we were close to each other or far away from each other would, would dissolve and become less meaningful. And inevitably, that would lead to also the end of geography, that location would no longer be relevant, that everything would be virtual, we'd be sitting in these cyberspaces where we collaborate and interact and, and actual meet space would become a lot less important. And so at the time, I was a geographer and, and Anthony was, was in urban planning. Um, another guy, uh, Matt Zook, at, uh, who was at UCL Berkeley, and another uh, gentleman, Martin Dodge, um, we're all kind of looking at this, well, what does it mean? What is the geography of cyberspace? What's the geography of the internet age? What does it look like? Um, it became very interesting because, you know, most of the perception was that at the time that, that there wasn't a geography, right? It was a, it was a, a non-geographical space of, of network nodes interlinked together, and this is some work from the, uh, uh, the Internet Data, Cooperative Analysis of Internet Data Association uh, that was running out of uh, uh, UC San Diego where they're, you know, taking these massive amounts of trace routes going across the Internet and trying to plot out what does the space of the Internet look like, and they come up with these, you know, beautiful 
graphics of showing the clustering of autonomous systems interconnecting to each other and routes of packets interconnecting autonomous systems and routers together. And what does that look like as far as how these things get interconnected together? And, and, and you know, there's a lot of popular perception. There were these commercials at the time from IBM that were, you know, have a desk out in the middle of nowhere and say, you know, IBM, the internet, location no longer matters, right? And the Mack truck would come flying by the guy at the desk in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so this geography is all very interesting. I remember seeing, you know, in 97, a, a thing in the Wall Street Journal saying IBM was going to put a billion dollars into e-commerce, which is kind of funny, as you know, talking with Anthony before here, just of how involved IBM has become around smart cities and, you know, the, the, the marketing shaping of, of technological shifts. Um, it's kind of interesting to see that the same player is popping up again and again. Um, and so we became interesting is what does this geography look like? And there's you know, kind of multiple perspectives looking at it. You know, is, is the geography of cyberspace something that's, that's not spatial in the sense that it's lat longs and coordinates, but it's like you know, the, the picture that we saw before, that it's, you know, it's a cyberspace and how do you navigate through cyberspace without, without physical navigation? Um, but then there was also the flip side of it as, of what does the meat space look like on the other side of it. And so Martin Dodge and Rod Kitchen have a great book that's kind of a coffee table edition called The Atlas of Cyberspace. Um, actually, the cool thing I found was that on, on Rob's site, you actually you can download the PDF for free and get all these graphics, which is where I stole most of them from, um, which was a lot of fun going back and looking at, at the old research. Um, but a lot of the stuff we, we looked at initially was, well, what is the physical plumbing that connects these things? So if geography no longer matters, then are all places equally connected was, was kind of the first hypothesis that we began to ask questions about. You know, if, if, if it's not relevant, then then there shouldn't be disparities in who's connected and who's not connected. Um, so we begin to map out the, the infrastructure. Um, so Anthony and Mitchell Moss have a great paper on the, uh, the metropolis and the, and the backbone of the internet and beginning to look at quantifying how connected cities are and what plumbing and fiber is connecting into those cities and is that pro providing an economic advantage in some places over other places as they grow and the internet age begins to blossom. Um, you know, during the late 90s. And so this is uh, one of the visualizations of the original NSF net and showing all the nodes connecting into it. Um, there's also a great space to play around with visualizations in as well. And it really kicked off kind of a, um, uh, a nice renaissance and people began to look at cartography and, and how do you visualize network spaces both uh, without geography and with physical geography. And, um, and this is some other stuff from Telegeography, which was a consultancy based in DC that looks at bandwidth flows. So you think of bandwidth as being you know, a, a commodity channel the way same way we have shipping lanes that allow products to move from point A to point B, but the products being bits instead of, instead of atoms. But here we can kind of see what the flows are, where are the most connected places. So you know, Hong Kong and China connect to each other a lot. Australia and Singapore, what are the hubs that are interconnecting these and what are the information flows between them? For a lot of the areas that we're really interested in of you know, what does that new, new version of commodity flows look like across the internet and how can we map that across geographic space? Because then going back to this thing is, you know, are all places equal? Is the geography not relevant? What places are more connected than, than other places? And again, this is like circa 1988, 1999 kind of bandwidth flows. Um, and if, you know, the interesting thing is, is going back and looking at uh, what the bandwidth was back then versus now as far as the amount of megabits connecting different cities together. Um, and then there's also uh, Matt Zook who was, uh, is at University of Kentucky now when he did this work as part of his dissertation, he was at UCAL Berkeley. Um, but he wanted to, to manifest out what do the domain name registries look like. And so you know, there's this huge boom in all these dot coms registering domains. Um, all across the globe, but every time you register a domain, you have to have a technical contact, you have to have a business contact. Um, so you go through and write scrapers to go through and mine all of those addresses where people were registering, where they were starting businesses and, and establishing domains, and then he plotted those out and did a whole bunch of really interesting regression and statistical analysis. And so here you can see in the Bay Area, each one of these blue dots is the number of domain names, and you can see it's a little bit of a graduated symbol there, and really looking at that density around the Bay Area. And here you can you know, pop into San Francisco and look into the Sonoma, Sonoma and Financial District and really see a lot of clusters. And what's interesting is as those clusters established back in the 90s, how much that still is very relevant today to look at where you know, the Web 2.0 startups or the mobile web startups or you know, as, as we begin to evolve, uh, how uh, uh, cyclical these things are, reinforcing the same places and locations over time. Uh, but there's a wide variety of work that was being done. Again, everybody you know, beginning to look at what's this geography of, of the internet writ large. Um, so this is the thing that John Quarterman did out of Austin, Texas. He had a company called MIDS that had a thing called the Internet Weather Report. And so we'd look at latency all across the globe and plot out 
um, what was the delay of packets being sent between major sites um, all across the web. And so, you know, similar to you go and see a weather report and see it's stormy, it's raining, it's snowing, what does the internet weather look like? Where are things slow? Where are they fast? Where is traffic? Where is congestion? Um, which was another really fascinating look at, at how the web was evolving. Um, and so, you know, from, from the standpoint of the, of the research that, that I was doing and a lot of the other folks around us, you know, the world kind of divided into two different things. There was, you know, there was bits and then there were atoms. Um, and so a lot of what uh, folks were looking at initially especially was what was the bit view of the internet, you know, whether it was that autonomous system graph of looking at how um, routers and uh, um, networks interconnect with each other or looking at flows of information one point to another, but they were all um, what we call kind of non-planar graphs, you know, things could connect directly to each other irregardless of where it went through physical space. Um, but as we begin to look at this, I got more and more interested as a geographer in being a very tactile kind of person of what do the atoms look like? What are the physical bits that allow this to happen? Um, you know, what's the actual fiber and copper that connects these places and, and who is actually connected? How does it get there? Um, what's the physical path that it has to take from point A to point B? What's, you know, what allows fiber to get built? What right-of-ways get let? What zoning laws allow some places to be really well wired while other places it's incredibly difficult to wire? And where exactly are all these things um, across the globe? And then, and then also, what does that look like as far as um, you know, these kind of single points of, of connectivity within a system? So this is the sea cable in Eastern Africa, and this, this is literally the only cable that connects Eastern Africa to the rest of the internet. That's it, right there. Right? You know, if, if that cable's no longer there, East Africa is no longer connected to the internet. And this fascinating, right? The fact that you know something that we see is such a, a massive scope. You know, all of what Google crawls and every person connected to Facebook and all that you know vast globe of information is all connected to that one little cable for you know an entire swath of, of the globe and a huge number of people um, and it's not the only place you know it, it, that happens to be you know in, in places that are less connected you get a lot of these you know single points where uh, entire connections to the web go into a single location uh, but then you have places like this is a shot from 60 Hudson Street um, and uh, uh, where you can see just huge numbers of cables going in, where you have you know hundreds of, of networks and autonomous autonomous systems physically meeting and interconnecting traffic and um, brokering uh, BGP sessions uh, in a physical building, and uh, and and that was interesting. Right? Is, is these things all have locations in in uh, in meet space and coordinates and addresses? And so this is a uh, a shot from Ben Mendelsohn's video. Um, they did, which is a great kind of 10 minute piece on infrastructure that goes in and talks about this, you know, hidden world of the infrastructure that drives the digital economy and kind of where these places are and what they look like. Um, so it's a great video to check out if you get a chance. Uh, but that's 60 Hudson Street here in New York. Again, this, this massive nexus of, of physical infrastructure that connects a lot of the web together. Uh, and so from this standpoint, I become really interested in what that landscape looks like. And so, you know, we kind of seen these visions of the web as far as how, how traffic flows and, and things disconnect and connect across a, uh, a virtual landscape. But I really wanted to understand what that physical landscape looked like. Where are the actual pipes? How do they get from point A to point B? And so this is a fiber landscape for, for Manhattan or for New York. And you can see where the fiber aggregations come along. So basically, the higher the peaks there in the little mountainscape, the more fiber that's sitting on top of each other in a, in a ditch or within a block of each other. Um, so you can kind of see as it comes in along the interstate, um, cuts across the Holland Tunnel, and then goes down to the financial district. So basically, you have this Boston-Washington corridor, right? And so you have all this fiber coming up coming up 95, and it routes up the interstate. It goes through the Holland Tunnel, and then it connects into the financial district where there's a huge amount of information consumers and information producers and it's connecting and providing those information flows to all those folks and then it kicks back out um, across the Brooklyn Bridge there I think and then heads back up again and on its way to Boston and then it branches off to different parts and then you can see the tendrils kind of working its way back up into Midtown um, and then north of the island you can see the connectivity and the amount of fiber um, dissipates out. Um, and so a lot of what I was interested in was, you know, what is the impact of this on economic activity and growth and what's the difference of people that are connected with huge amounts of fiber and people that don't have fiber? Um, you know, is there, a, is there a physical digital divide um, that results in some cities being more connected and certain neighborhoods and cities and districts being more connected and is, is that causing disparities and, and who's benefiting from the internet age. But remember this is kind of you know, early 90s, uh, 
mid to late 90s, and these were a lot of open questions, because most people were saying, you know, pundits at the time, that geography didn't matter. Everybody was connected, right? All you had to be was, was on the web. But when we began to map these things out, that we saw that it was a lot of similar hierarchies with some shifts of a lot of the power brokers were the ones that were really getting a significant advantage with the amount of fiber and connectivity that they had in a place, and that allowed them to do businesses and create um, information and information economies that other places that weren't as well connected didn't have the ability to do. Um, so here you can kind of see a, a 2D view of that. You come into the New York Stock Exchange and you have these co-location facilities and then you also have uh, electrical power that's needed to uh, uh, provide all the energy for these co-location facilities and, and big hubs of telecommunications that are massive uh, power, power drains. And you can kind of see where the you know the hot spots of, of activity here. And a lot of times it's because of the right of ways. You know, you know, there's only so many places that you can dig fiber um, into a city. And so that's why you see Holland Tunnel, right? It's open for a lot of people to put fiber into. And then the other routes are either more expensive, or you have to have uh, municipal right of ways to get permits to lay fiber into there. You have to get permits to dig it into the streets. And so people end up using the same right of ways repeatedly. Um, and you get these massive aggregations because it's kind of supply and demand as well as municipal and urban regulation that cause these things to converge into singular places um, in cities that become these really massive hubs. Um, uh, and so this is kind of where we were plugging along, again, originally looking at it from a digital divide, um, social equity, social justice standpoint, uh, and then 9-11 happened. Um, and, and folks began to come to us and say, hey, uh, what happens when this infrastructure gets impacted by, um, by a natural disaster or a, uh, or a purposeful attack? Um, what are the impacts on what happens to the city if we lose some of these key infrastructures? And to be honest, it was something that we had never really thought of, um, but you know, as academic folks, they threw a big grant at us, and um, so we saluted our professors and went off to go do the analysis, um, which ended up being fairly fascinating as far as, you know, we had always kind of looked at these networks um, it was also interesting because around the same time you were beginning to get uh, you know, the real upswing in complexity science and, and network science and folks using graph theory and statistical mechanics to look at large complex networks. And so as we were plotting out and mapping these things, we said, well, they're all interconnected networks. Um, and we found a lot of the same um, statistical properties in these networks that folks found in um, other large scale uh, networks that folks like Watts and Strogatz and uh, the folks doing the small world network theory, um, Barabasi and Mark Newman. Et cetera. And, and basically what all their findings were, were coming up with was that these networks that are massively interconnect a lot of people, whether it's friendship and social networks or an internet graph like the autonomous system one that we saw earlier, is that these networks become incredibly efficient by having uh, a small number of nodes that have the vast majority of connections in the network. So you get a place like 60 Hudson Street that has thousands of connections of fiber going into it, and that allows you to be very efficient, that all you have to do is get to 60 Hudson Street and you get anywhere in the world very quickly once you get there. Um, so very similar to a hub and spoke with an airline network, right? You know, I, I flew in through Philly from Ann Arbor, and so you know, once I got to a hub, it was really easy to get to New York. Um, so that allows networks to be traversed very quickly. The problem with that is you see when you do air travel, it's like Chicago O'Hare gets fogged in, or there's freak snow in Atlanta, all of a sudden, massive delays across the network. Basically the same thing happens within uh, the information uh, infrastructure networks is that when you lose one of these major hubs, or you lose a major link, that it causes mass perturbations to the system and delays. So kind of going back to the internet weather map, right? When you have these big failures, all of a sudden uh, you get a lot of delays that perturbate through the system. And so basically what we did is we said, all right, let's recreate what happened on the World Trade Center um, and see what happened to the fiber network. Um, and, and you know there were some documented impacts of, of that failing. So here you can see the circle of, of you can see the links that were kind of removed there from where we were before. And then you can see this flux of, uh, of green that kind of shoots up, showing uh, the traffic backing up. And you know on the day with 9/11, there was a lot of backups of phone calls failing, a uh, central office got taken out, um, and there were some impacts, but not major impacts, especially to the internet, mostly to the telecommunication system. Um, and then we went through and said, well, what happens if the Holland Tunnel fails? And all of a sudden you see this massive spike in traffic all having to go up to, uh, to the George Washington Bridge, I believe. And, uh, and you get massive perturbations as far as the amount of traffic and there not being enough fiber and, uh, and things getting uh, repercussed back in a big way. Uh, so we also looked at other places. This is Charlotte. 
um, probably a little bit less familiar as far as looking at the geography. It's not nearly as distinctive as, as New York. Uh, but you can see similar kind of spikes. And, and Charlotte is another big financial hub, uh, uh, much like New York. And here we can see where these, uh, these big financial spikes came. So they wanted us to look at things like if the natural gas line uh, failed or, or blew up in, in the heart of Charlotte, in the financial district, what would happen? And uh, so we modeled that out. So you kind of see here the craters is where the connectivity has been lost and these places have been disconnected. And the places that spike up in the blue are where you have backups and congestion now where things have slowed down. And so there's basically modeling as, as the traffic perturbates through the system, what happens to it. And then all the green dots are all the financial institutions that are getting impacted by it. So all the green dots that are in these kind of cavernous valleys are places that have gotten disconnected from the web. Um, uh, and fiber and information flows and their ACM systems and all the things that do the financial backups and, and routings of funds for transfer and so forth. Um, but the thing that really got people upset, and a lot of these slides were um, after we, we'd been, been doing this, we got pulled on a dog and pony show around, around DC. Um, basically, we, we did presentations like this, and uh, since we're in DC, somebody said, hey, why don't you go brief this government official? Um, and so they took us over to the White House where uh, Richard Clark, um, who's kind of the bombastic cybersecurity czar back in, uh, back in the 90s, or back in the kind of 2001, it was like 2003 or so. Um, and so we showed, we showed him this, uh, some of these visualizations and it ended up that the Federal Reserve Bank um, in Charlotte, which is a pretty major um, uh, fund transfer location, was in the bottom of this particular trial for this particular simulation that we ran, which is thoroughly random. I mean, we just you know pick a spot and said, all right, see what happens if something perturbates here. And uh, but this this kind of stuff tended to get them fairly fairly upset. And uh, and so then we get this kind of approach where uh, they send us to go talk to the NSA and the CIA and the FBI, and we kind of did this dog and pony show to all the different three letter agencies. Um, and it was a bit of a conundrum for, for these folks that we went to go brief. They, they'd be incredibly upset with what we were able to discover um, because it was all open source data. Um, you know, the data was all publicly available, things that we had collected on our own. Um, you know, a, a lot of this back in, in the late 90s, um, you know, working with Anthony and, and Martin and, and Matt and so forth, just horse traded with folks on uh, network operating listservs, a thing called the North American Network Operators Group, where all the folks that run the BGP tables um, to interconnect all the networks email back and forth uh, and, and post up messages and so forth. And, and basically, you know, got a couple of fiber maps for different networks and say, hey, I'll trade you MCI for AT&T. And they're like, oh, cool, you got MCI? Yeah, I got at and I'll give it to you. It's like, awesome. But I mean, this is the 90s, right? There, was, there wasn't a fear of security issues, and everybody was trying to demonstrate how connected their network was, that MCI was better than AT&T, and AT&T was better than level three, et cetera. Um, and so it was, it was a lot of marketing. And so people were pretty fluid with the data. And once we got a little bit of it, we were able to horse trade to get a whole lot of it. Um, but the government had never been able to get this right because the government comes, I, the government, post 9 11, want to know where all of your fiber is. And, you know, Corporation A freaks out and is like, no way I'm telling you. Because in reality, half the time they don't know because it's in the bowels of the guy who's on the Nanog list or who doesn't want to deal with his boss and won't tell him that they actually have data somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so when we were actually able to put this data together and then run simulations over it, um, the government folks really kind of freaked out over it and said, what, this exists? We didn't think it exists. They told us it didn't exist. We went and talked to the company yesterday and they said, this doesn't exist. You, you have it right here. Where did you get it from? And uh, <laughs> we're like, ah, it's a long story. Uh, but the problem was is that you know, we weren't under a government contract. We were just researchers within a university. There wasn't a mechanism to classify it. They look at the data and say, that should be classified. You know, it should be in the bowels of some place, but we don't have a mechanism to actually classify it because you're just a bunch of grad students to put this together. Um, uh, and so it was interesting. And so about this time, a, uh, a Washington, Washington Post reporter heard that we were uh, freaking out a lot of government officials, and so they sent a reporter out to uh, come see what we were doing. They said, hey, we're writing this piece about how university researchers are helping to fight the war on terrorism, and we want to do a piece on you guys. And we said, well, that's cool. I don't know if we're fighting the war on terrorism, but you know, we're, we're trying to do some basic research on you know, how interconnected cities are and what their infrastructure looks like and if there's potential vulnerabilities that are caused by co-location and, and zoning laws and if you put in more resiliency and add more diversity that would make the city better regardless even you know, this for disasters and things along those lines. Um, but anyways, long story short, the reporter spent like three days with us traveling around, um, then disappeared and heard nothing for a month and, and was actually out at uh, 
at University College of London with, uh, with Martin, who did Atlas of Cyberspace, and we were working on a new project. And, and I think it was one of these super slow news cycles where they're, they're looking for something to put in the news because nothing's going on. And so they grab the story off the shelf and said, oh, there's this grad student who's endangering the nation as a threat to national security. Let's put that on the front page of the Post and see what happens. And you know, as it being a slow news day, then you know, Fox and CNN and all these folks pick up on it. And, um, and so you know, we get called in London and they tell us we needed to go to some studio and we get interviewed by somebody who asked why we're, why we're helping terrorists. And, um, and it, was, it was a rather bizarre you know, week or two weeks and it kind of spread out. And it was unfortunately where there was no good news stories coming and then it snowballs and the media gets a hold of it and they completely mistreat it and they say, you know, you know the, the dissertation's been classified and you know, I've been locked up and all these bad things have happened. But it was never, the dissertation wasn't classified. You can get it at the library. You can actually buy it as a book on Amazon. I don't recommend that. It's incredibly boring. It's a dissertation. Um, but there is this perception within the media now around this larger issue of, of, uh, of security and openness. Of You have all this public data that's, that's produced by the government. You know, because at that time, you could get uh, FERC filings for where all the transmission lines and all natural gas pipelines were. And it was available as GIS files that you could download off of DOE websites. And so we got tons of data on all sorts of stuff over the years. And we massed this you know, big uh, you know, file directory of, of GIS-shaped files and other formats that we had pulled. And, and, you know, hodgepodge of stuff, and, but people were, were upset with our hodgepodge of stuff, but they weren't sure what to do about it because all of the data was open, it had come from publicly available sources, and then it had been collected in a way that then made them concerned. Uh, and so this kind of opened a big policy issue and it was where the, you know, the media latched on, is like you know, all of our openness um, as governments has caused us to be insecure as a nation, has opened us to be vulnerable to terrorist attacks, and it's a horrible, horrible thing, right? And, and as, as a result of putting this stuff together, you've now aided and abetted terrorists and you've made the nation less secure. Um, and so we were kind of on the, on the side of trying to provide a slightly more rational argument around it, but um, eventually you know, it snowballed. And, and the fascinating thing was that the intelligence community, um, once they figured out they didn't have a mechanism to classify it, they figured they should fund it instead. <laughs> So yeah, control it one way or the other, right? Yeah, I can't classify it, you're not part of the government, so I'll fund it and then I have you know, some way to direct it. Um, which is interesting, so this is where Inkytel came in, and Inkytel is kind of the venture arm for the CIA originally, and now it's branched off and there's a whole bunch of intelligence agencies and non-intelligence agencies and civilian agencies that pump money into Inkytel. And basically they act like a venture capitalist, except for they, um, uh, they're less sharky, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. So I guess you know, it depends on what your definition of of sketchy is. is it sketchy because they're working for the CIA or is it sketchy because it's a VC and, and VCs are sharky, right? It's kind of pick your poison. But so they, they came in and funded the, the research, um, which was interesting because they, of all the folks that kind of do venture investment, Inkytel had probably done the most around geography, um, which was kind of fascinating to us at the time. Um, that they, they had funded Keyhole, which became Google Earth, which I'm, I'm sure probably all of us have, have used and really completely changed the way I think that the public views geography and, and the way people interact with it, especially from a, a digital and software perspective. Uh, then they invested in Atlas software, which became all the 3D buildings that you see on Google Earth. They also embedded, uh, invested in Metacarta, which built a lot of the open source mapping technologies, uh, like open layers uh, that a lot of folks use today, um, as well as the ability to take unstructured text and, and create locations out of it. So it was very interesting from a technical perspective in that they had a lot of uh, background and understanding of, of geographic things. Um, and so uh, as the turn of events happened, they ended up investing in the company and, uh, and we ended up actually doing some work for the intelligence agencies, which was an interesting experience in and of itself because um, none of us had a security clearance and still none of us have a security clearance within the, within the company. Um, but basically they, they give us requirements of, of things that they would like to be able to, uh, to do within the software. Like I want to do spatio-temporal animations of data over time. I want to be able to do geoprocessing tasks. And so we say, cool, we'll add that as a capability. And they write us a check for it. Um, but inevitably it was like, you know, we don't want to do a bunch of work for the military industrial complex that gets thrown into a hole and nobody ever sees it, which was completely um, antithetical to what we had set off to do with was collecting open data and educating citizens around it, um, which was interesting because where we spun out of it this whole time was at George Mason University, 
Um, and we were within a school of public policy, so our, our charter was, was interesting in that we were collecting all this data to do analysis to inform citizens so they'd be smarter about policy decisions that were happening, and then also policymakers would be smarter on the repercussions of what they do, um, especially for urban policy, and, and then also as we got into it on the national security side of things. Um, and uh, uh, and from Inkydel's perspective, they came at it from a different direction. So we were trying to figure out, you know, how can we take all this data that we have that's sitting on our file drives and make it available to citizens to be able to do interesting and engaging things with. Um, natural disaster now. <laughs> Didn't map that one out. Um, but Inkytel's perspective was they wanted to solve the problem of what do you do after you zoom in on your house on Google Earth? You know, because they, you know, they supplied Keyhole to the intelligence community, and it was awesome, right? You know, I could go and say, where's 180 Varick Street? I could see a 3D building and see what's on there. Um, but what do I do after that? You know, what's, what's the next thing? How do I answer a question on top of this? Um, and so the kind of the compromise between the two is we said, okay, it's interesting. You guys have money. We're poor grad students that don't have any money, and we want to turn this into software that can go and help people. Um, and so basically the, the compromise between the two was that we're going to take the funding to build the software. You can go deploy it into the intelligence community behind the firewall. We have no idea what you're going to do with it. Um, but we want to go deploy it to the public web and make it free for anybody to use. Um, and we got into a fight about whether or not you know, the software could be open, open source or not. And um, yeah, VCs five or six years ago had an allergic reaction to open source, but they didn't know what open data was particularly. And so we said, all right, well, then all the data within there is going to be open for anybody to use and repurpose however they like. Um, and so that's what we ended up building was this site called Geocommons, where basically the concept was let's take our file drive that we have within our university with the thousands of data sets we've collected over time, let's put it on the web, and then allow other people to add their data to it, download our data, and then remix their data with our data and anybody else that puts data into the system. Um, and see, so can we create a network effect for the data? Um, so, you know, we, we think a lot of times of applications of Metcalfe's law of, you know, as you add in uh, more users, the value of the network increases exponentially. We said, well, can we do the same thing with data? You know, data is more valuable if I can take my data and look at it in the context of your data, plus the city of New York's data, plus all of DOE's or EPA's data. You know, I should be able to take any of this data fluidly and reconnect it and remix it with somebody else's data to create new value out of it. And the more data that we add into the system, them, the more value we'll be able to create for everybody that contributes uh, across it. Um, and then if, uh, you know, and if the, and whoever wants to participate and use the data is open to do so. And so it was a Creative Commons license, so there was no restrictions. All you had to do was attribute who you got the data from, right? So if I, I'm taking data from the city of New York, I need to attribute that I got the data from the city of New York, was basically the only restriction on using anything in the platform, and then we would host the service and make it available for everybody. Um, so that ended up working pretty well. The, you know, the intelligence folks funded and gave us a lot of money to build it out. They got to use things within their environment. And then we had a great uh, open data project where we could bring in a lot of content and make it freely available to anybody that wanted to contribute, participate, or just browse and check things out. Um, which led into some interesting things. We started off with just collecting data. Um, and and then we, we began to look and say, well, we want to let people do interesting things with the data. You know, kind of, you know, what do you do after you zoom in on your house? Okay, I have data. How do I answer questions with the data? And so we began to pull in, pull in different uh, information from different sources and then give people really simple tools to visualize things. Um, which also kind of, you know, a lot of this was, you know, serendipitous opportunities to address things that drove us nuts as grad students. So one of the things that drove us nuts as grad students was using GIS software. Um, and that it was really clunky. It was a desktop tool. It was a pain in the ass to learn. The only person in the department that usually knew how to use it was me and my other buddies that were, were working on it. And, like, and so it was me and two professors, Raj and Lori, that were, that were working on this. And inevitably, we had to do everybody's work, right? Because we were the GIS people. So they'd stack us up with all sorts of mundane things, like making a map of average rent and underage drinking. Um, and so we'd be stuck, you know, working the weekends on putting these things together. We said, this is really annoying. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to go through and make a really simple core plot map with some proportional symbols on top of it to answer the question. It's not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. There's a whole lot of professors that should be able to knock this out. And even more importantly, when we go and present this to citizens, they would look at it and say, wow, that's really cool. And it would be usually something like this. Like, you make a map of average rent. They say, well, I want to know where I can get decent rent without having a bunch of drunk college kids around. 
that are going to make it really loud and I don't want to live there. And so I want to go add some data on underage drinking on top of this map that NYU did and answer my own personal question with it. And so, but we wanted, so we wanted to be able to empower people to do this, but we wanted to do it without them having to learn GIS, go spend $2,000 on a desktop system to do so. So we wanted to see if we could put this stuff into a web browser to enable anybody to go and do it. Um, and so that's kind of where we, we popped into this. So we started off just doing basic thematic mapping. I won't get into the thing, but there's you know, basically these little guided tutorials that walk you through the process of, of making a map with data. So, okay, here's your data, here's the distribution of your data, um, which one of these distributions, you know, standard deviation, manual breaks, um, uh, matches your data. So match the histograms and then you pick it and it maps the data the way that you know, theoretically it should look and it kind of walks you through this process of a little guided tour of, of how do you go from raw data to visualize information that you know, at least if you took an intro cartography class, you'd at least get a B on the paper if you made your map. Um, which was interesting because it, it began to open uh, you know, a series of, of interesting kind of challenges was in this, uh, was as people put in data, how do I begin to know what data to trust and what's the lineage and pedigree of the data, where did it come from as people work on the data and it morphs and it changes and it evolves over time, how do I understand how it went up from point A to point B and is that something that I have confidence in as it morphed and changed? Um, so we do a great job of this with code, right? We have things like GitHub and uh, code repositories that track as we take various open source projects and we fork data and change it, and we can track back to the lineage and see what parts we like and we trust and who did it and where and when. And basically, we want to see if we can do the same thing with data, right? Can we go through and as people upload data? And so this was, you know, the underage drinking came from Ian Duncan. I can click on Ian Duncan and see who he is, what else he's done, some background on him. I can also see that Ian didn't tell me the source. I'm pretty sure, you know, he says up here that the data came from the New York State Liquor Authority, but he didn't give me a link back to the source of where it came from. So I'm basically taking uh, Ian's word that he did a good job with it. I can't go back to see if he actually got the raw data. So that's the same point I might say, eh, you know, it looks cool, but I don't trust it because I can't actually verify that the data is correct. And so I might decide to chuck it. But basically, we leave it open for people to put in whatever the heck they want. But uh, they, but your decision to use it is based on kind of how much of a pedigree they've given to the content that they've done. And then we do a lot of it automatically. Like we automatically track that it was Ian who did it. Um, we give him a whole bunch of metadata statistics of when he uploaded it, how many features and attributes. We go through and do a bunch of statistical analysis on what's the range and the statistical attributes of everything that got uploaded into it. Uh, but then the user has to provide what the pedigree and where the data came from. Um, and then as we began to look at it, you know, folks said, wow, this is cool, we can make thematic maps and so forth, but really want to begin to do some analysis. You know, I want to answer a meaningful question with the data beyond just visualizing it. Uh, so we got into providing analysis um, to it, which was also a, a pretty interesting technical challenge because you know, most of these are kind of lumped into geoprocessing and statistical tasks, and generally you get a big uh, desktop engine that runs through and does this to you, but we wanted to do it in a web browser. Um, which was uh, which was a challenging issue because you know we'll do you know roughly you know eighty thousand unique visitors to the site, which isn't huge by web standards. But if you have eighty thousand people that are going through and running big geoprocessing tasks on fairly decent sized data sets, a lot of computational load um, onto your backend infrastructure. And, and typically, the way GIS companies had done this in the past was you had a single server, and that server does your processing task, and you send stuff to it. But that wouldn't scale when you have thousands of people looking at doing processing tasks at the same time. So we ended up building this kind of distributed architecture where it's like a queuing mechanism. The data come, the request comes in saying, I want to do an aggregation. I want to take all those underage drinking um, points and I want to sum them up by zip code or census block and get a, and get a pattern to see what it looks like. Or I want to get a buffer around each one of those um, underage uh, 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 drinking things and then intersect it with a bar. Um, and see what's the buffer inside the bar of, you know, where the bar within a kilometer of it. So you're kind of answering these specific questions. So basically, the, the, the queue has the request that sends it to a worker. You can spin up as many workers as you want. The worker grabs a job. It does one of these geoprocessing tasks, and it kicks it back, um, which was interesting because it allowed us to scale it to a huge number of people doing these things. Um, but really, the challenge was uh, more that so that was a technical challenge. And the user challenge was, how do I explain to somebody how to do a geoprocessing task, right? I say geoprocessing and probably the majority of you guys don't know what I'm talking about. And it was the same thing with our users. They didn't know what a geoprocessing task was. They didn't know what GIS was. Um, but they did understand, you know, wanting to answer some basic questions, right? In aggregation, I want to sum the points of my data set into a set of boundaries or polygons. 
Um, and so basically we gave them this kind of list that had you know, little nifty graphics to show you going from you know, data to the analysis, give a little description, and then there's also a thing that says details that gives you a little tutorial. Um, since all things location-based talk about coffee, we made all the examples coffee shops. Um, just a little bit tongue-in-cheek because we were a little cynical on all the coffee shop location-based services. Uh, and then you know, showing a before and after, right? You know, here are the points of all the Dunkin' Donuts in the Northeast. Let's aggregate them, see which state has the most Dunkin' Donuts, and then you know, learn to use the analysis. There's a little video to walk you through it if you don't know how to do it. So we spent a lot of time thinking about kind of contextual help. So you know, as a citizen comes in, a user comes in, how do you not overwhelm them with all the things you could do within geographic analysis and have to take a you know, multi-week training course? How do I answer the specific question they have at the point that they have the question with contextual help that gives them just enough to whet their appetite, to get them to go jump off the cliff and do an analysis with their data set, um, but not be so scared seeing ads is way too much. Um, which is fascinating because in the back end we run a lot of analytics to track you know, who's doing analysis, how many analyses are they running, you know, who, who runs an analysis and comes back and does another analysis later. Um, so it's also fascinating just from like a, a learning mechanism of, of how users do more sophisticated tasks and where they fall off and where they get engaged and what percentage of people go from I'm going to download data, I'm going to look at a map, I'm going to make a map, I'm actually going to run an analysis and answer a sophisticated question. Um, it's really interesting to kind of see the dynamics of, of the user population of how many people make it that far up the funnel. Um, but this is, again, you know, kind of simplifying this stuff as much as you can. Um, so, you know, here's my, my data set, underage drinking in the East Village. I want to aggregate it, which is step two. I can choose my analysis. I choose to do aggregation. I want a boundary I'm going to aggregate to, so I choose census tracts. Um, and then I decided oh, I want to keep the empty boundaries, so if there's nothing there, do I just want to drop it off or do I want to keep it there so it looks pretty? Um, and then what kind of analysis do I want to run? So, you know, what was the maximum number of penalty days somebody received for underage drinking? Or what was the average number of penalty days somebody received? And so now for each one of those census tracts, it'll tell us, you know, what was the max number of penalty days? What was the average number of days? Um, and then I just click Create. Um, and it kicks off and runs uh, kind of asynchronously. So see those little messages up there? Same with the queue. When it's done with your analysis, it sends you a little message to let you know your analysis is done. Um, so if it's something that runs for a long time. So those of you that have used GIS, oftentimes you get these, uh, we call it the spinning globe of death. And it spins and you don't know how long it's going to spin. You might get coffee, you may have to come back in the morning. But like when we, were, when we were in school, we'd have three or four desktops for each of us because each one would be running a big processing task and you'd be sitting there hoping it would finish, but you know, it locked up your entire station. So then you'd have to go to your next station and kick off the next analysis and keep waiting and running. So we said, screw this, we got the web, right? We'll just do a messaging queue, run it in the background, send me a message when it's done, look, or, and then it loads it into the background if you're still on the map. Um, so again, this is like kind of excuses of people gave us money to f solve problems that drove us nuts as users. Um, and then the other cool thing was we really were interested in tracking how people created an analysis and got from point A to point B, which is another thing that drove us nuts as users is, you know, you'd read an academic paper, you see a map that somebody created, and you say, well, how did they get there? What was the workflow that got them from point A to point B? Because either I want to know, because I want to know if I trust the outcome and the result that they came to, or at some point in there, I want to fork it and say, you know what, I wouldn't have aggregated that to census blocks, I would have aggregated it to zip codes. Um, or you know, it was too big of an aggregation, I would have gone to something more granular, I wouldn't have done an aggregation, I would have done a buffer analysis of some sort. So you know, I want to be able to fork off and go in another direction. And so basically, whenever somebody ran an analysis, we would automatically create this. So just by clicking that button where it said create, it automatically builds this page with the result. And so it goes in and it creates a little sentence saying, you know, in an aggregation of underage drinking in the Manhattan census tract. So it just goes through and automatically creates a title for you, automatically creates a description, and then it tracks the related data sets. So what data sets were used to create this data set. So you click on that tab and it shows you the inputs that created the analysis and tracks back to it. And then permissions, who's allowed to see it, that I created it, the date that I created it. Um, so the nice thing is whenever you create a map and you use any of this, there's a little pedigree pop-up that tells all the data sets and steps that went into the creation of it. So you can always go back to see how somebody got to making this map, right? So you, you see this map and say, wow, that's pretty cool. I can see the under is drinking. There's some filters on there. They aggregated it. Um, but basically, you just click the About button and it goes back and tells you how this thing got created, when I did it, how I did it, if I use other people's data sets other than mine, where they link from, where they got that data from, is it data I trust? You know, it's, again, I might go back and say, wow, this is a brilliant analysis, but it came from some dude named Ian 
who had no citation, he might have just made it up and drop some points onto the map with a spreadsheet. I have no idea if this is actually real underage drinking data or not. I'm trusting that Ian did actually get it from the, uh, uh, from the, from the Liquor Commission, but, but I don't know because I don't have a link back to verify it. Um, so this ended up in another kind of serendipitous um, intersection with what we did. So we're, we're showing off the, the Geogama stuff at South by Southwest um, maybe three or four years ago. And, uh, and we ran into a, a guy named Todd Huffman who was uh, doing humanitarian relief work in Afghanistan. And so he was based in Jalalabad uh, working with a guy named Dave Warner who were setting up uh, telemedicine operations. And so they had been staying in this guest house um, that was a former United Nations compound. So it was on UN international territory. Uh, the UN moved into a bigger, fancier compound, but they kept the, the land. Uh, and so this guest house emerged and these Australian mercenaries were running the guest house. And so Todd and Dave were crashing there and then they lost their contract um, for whatever mercenary stuff they were doing. And, uh, and they said, hey, you know, Dave, Todd, you guys got to move out. And they said, ah, we don't want to move out, we really like it because since it's on international land, there's a bar and getting alcohol in Afghanistan is quite difficult. Um, so it's literally the only place in eastern Afghanistan you could get a uh, beer. Um, and so we really like the fact that we have a beer and it, and it works out quite well. And they said, well, why don't you just take over the lease? And I said, okay, sure, we'll take over the lease. So they signed over the lease to Dave and Todd and they began running it. Um, Dave was doing telemedicine work, so he, had, he was doing sat up links to the university and to the hospitals around eastern Afghanistan so that they could bring in uh, better uh, health education, health information to educate and provide better services to the local population um, around healthcare. So, so the cool thing was he had all this really sophisticated sat up link stuff. Um, so in addition to having a bar, once Dave took over, they also had Wi-Fi. Um, so you combine having Wi-Fi and beer, it quickly became the hottest place in all of Jalalabad and all of eastern Afghanistan, and everybody came there to hang out. Um, and so a lot of informal networks sprung up um, around Jalalabad, and a lot of the humanitarian NGOs, expats, and folks that were doing work in the area, um, you know, trying to help out on a variety of different projects. Um, and so, and a lot of informal data swapping started happening. Say, hey, I'm working on this project to, um, to restore agriculture and convert poppy farms into soybeans. Um, and I have, you know, where all the river and watersheds are, you know, and the other person's like, hey, I have where all the illegal poppy production's been done. Why don't we trade data? Um, and so this became such a, a popular activity. Uh, Todd came up with the idea of, well, why don't we have a formal program where we trade beer for data? And so literally, if you put your data on the hard drive and you said who you were um, and had a contact for it, you got a free beer. Um, the more data you gave, the more beer you got. Um, so it became really popular. Uh, but one of the problems they had was like, OK, cool, we have all these you know, Excel files and shape files and CSVs and KML files, uh, but we don't have anything to do with them. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and a lot of people didn't have GIS software to run, to run stuff, and it was expensive, and they are running around, and so um, Todd started using GeoCommons to map stuff out. And so we ran into himself by Southwest, he's like, oh, I love you guys. I use this site all the time to map stuff in Afghanistan, but we're going off of a set uplink off a of gator ball, so it's really slow, and it's kind of a pain in the ass. Do you guys like, have something I could just run on the bar? Um, so we have like you know these big servers that we give to the spooky people to go run into their places, but it's really expensive. And and, it, and he goes, no, I need to fit in my backpack. And so we said, oh, we have these Mac Minis that we use for conferences because internet at conferences is ridiculously expensive or super slow. And so we just run the software locally on a Mac Mini. We said, hey, why don't you take the Mac Mini? So we gave him the Mac Mini, threw it into his backpack, took it to Afghanistan. Um, it ended up being a huge hit for them because then once people could see their data, they started contributing more data. Um, and then some folks from the UN saw it and said, hey, we want to use this to do election monitoring. Um, so then we ended up working with Google and Yushahidi and some other folks and we loaded a bunch more stuff onto the Mac Mini and they did a huge part of the election monitoring for 2009 um, off this little Mac Mini. And the fascinating thing was what is that they discovered in like 12 hours. Um, and the cool thing was with the Mac Mini, we would federate the data back up to GeoCommons. So as they got sat up link, um, we would connect in and federate the data off of it and then post it to GeoCommons and let anybody go use the data. And so as the election data was coming off and they were doing monitoring with Yushihidi and um, what the uh, observers were seeing on the ground and then also with the early polling results that were coming back from the various polling stations and the location of the polling stations and all the tribal demographics, that was all getting pushed to GeoCommons. And then there was this community of researchers that were grabbing that information, doing analysis, posting it back to GeoCommons, and then we'd push it back down to Afghanistan. The amazing thing was like within you know, 24, 36 hours of the election, 
the, the community basically came back and said, hey, Cardside is rigging the election in all the Pashtun areas. Um, you know, all of the election results are fluctuating up and down. They did some cool statistical analysis of when uh, man-made distributions enter into a normal distribution uh, called a Benford Index. And also the Benford Index was off the chart in all the Pashtun areas. All the Yushihidi reports of citizens saying they saw ballot stuffing or violence or trying to scare people away from polling areas were all in the Pashtun areas. And all those places where Cartsite was, was kicking ass um, as far as the vote totals. And then the other weird thing happened was you go from 10% to you know, 15 to 20% uh, folks that had reported. And as the, as the percent reported went up, the actual number of votes from the ballots went down. Uh, and so basically they were taking out the ballots they didn't like after and then reporting, but still having to report the number of people that had gone and voted and then tallied. And so you get these weird kind of things going on. But anyways, it was, you know, and then two months later, it you know, formally gets acknowledged that, that Cardside had rigged the election. They still did nothing about it, which was a bit depressing, but um, that is Afghanistan. Uh, so overall, GeoCommons has been a, been a ton of fun to work on. 42,000 contributors, 106,000 different data sources, data sets. Within those, over 600,000 mappable layers. People have served up over 15 million maps, 4 million downloads, and about 80,000 or so folks come and check it out on a pretty regular basis. Um, which kind of goes into the, the last thing that I wanted to cover was kind of where is this all going next from what we're looking at, both from an urban standpoint, but also just a data, data standpoint. Um, and initially, most of what we were doing on, on GeoCommons was about static data. You know, people uploaded things like average rent from 2000 from the census. Uh, or underage drinking for the month of October in you know, 2011. Um, but increasingly as you know, mobile devices came online and, and sensors became more ubiquitous, the data was streaming and flowing and it wasn't something that was static. Um, and as that data flowed, it was getting tagged with time and location and interesting attributes. And so you know, this data wasn't static, it was this fluid dynamic thing. And we really wanted to understand how that was impacting stuff. Because what fascinated us was that you know, so much of what we were doing was trying to take this GIS world of data and make it available to all of the citizens that hadn't been able to access it, right? Because you know, all these cities and the open data movements, um, they're pushing out all this data from the cities, um, but how do you allow citizens to really engage with that? And I don't mean engaging it by looking at it and, you know, in a web map viewer and clicking on stuff, but you know, how do they really put their data in there? How do they answer questions? How do they really you know, stick their fingers into it and, and become part of it versus just having this passive view of data that's getting pushed out from, from, from cities and, and you know, folks creating these web portals to look at stuff? We really want to figure out how do we engage with folks around that because so few people really had a, um, you know, thought about geography beyond Google Earth. Um, so really, you know, it was a lot of a mission of you know, how do you educate citizens and get them more engaged to really understand data. Um, and then in the middle of doing this, some interesting stuff happened, right? Is you had to get the explosion of this kind of geosocial universe. You know, the mobile devices um, become explosive. The number of mobile devices that have GPS enabled becomes huge. So, you know, 5.3 billion mobile devices, and then each one of these are services that folks are running on a mobile device and the number of users that they have. You know, Facebook, 630 million. And then the circle that's inside of the circle, the darker one, is the percentage of those users that use that service from a mobile device. Um, and then you get these you know, pure startups like uh, Foursquare, Goal is gone, BrightGuide's gone, Loop's gone. Um, <laughs> Google Latitude's still there. Uh, you know, they're running purely on a mobile device. So this is interesting because right? this is just you know, 2011. This wasn't that long ago and it's already quite dated. Um, uh, and then you also kind of look at this as smartphone penetration as well. Is, you know, this ability to have phones that generate data that's structured and, uh, and also has multimedia internet capabilities and GPS uh, location capabilities. Um, so here you can kind of see smartphone shipments in Western Europe um, above 50% heading towards 80% pretty quickly by 2011. Uh, same thing in North America, past it, quickly coming along uh, behind it. And then you have the rest of the world that's still uh, dragging you know, around 20% when it comes to the smartphone side of things. Uh, which was interesting for us since we do a lot of humanitarian and disaster response work in, uh, in developing countries where smartphones aren't ubiquitous and you're really just looking at SMS. Um, so there's, there's still really interesting digital divides, which was a lot of our original research to begin with. Um, but that's rapidly changing, you know, even though the number is an aggregate. Um, again, you know, as we see with the changing in the ecosystem of the, of the various mobile applications, also 
um, access to smartphones is changing incredibly rapidly. Uh, in Kenya, the hottest selling phone is uh, an Android phone that's $80 with GPS. And you know, in 2011, the first three months that they sold it, 350,000 units got pushed just in Kenya. Um, so you know, as that cost curve goes down on smart tablets, smartphones, there's a huge um, appetite for these things in the developing world as well. Um, and it's not just phones, 14 or 18% of laptops, 43% of portable video games, GPS enabled. 72% uh, of users access social media sites and blogs through their mobile devices. So not only are they using smartphones for, um, uh, for traditional forms of communication like email, text messaging, and phone, but they're also using social media and creating a lot, a lot of rich information through that mobile device. And every time they hit the mobile device, when they create that information, that's creating a lot long tag and a time tag to go with it as well as other kind of statistical data. 40% uh, of the content on Twitter came from mobile devices in 2011. Um, what's fascinating though is only about 2 to 3% of that actually has a lot long associated with it from the GPS. So there's still a huge gap between the number of people that are using Twitter specifically on a mobile device and the number that are enabling hyper accurate location of that content. Um, which comes to uh, you know, some of the challenges of beginning to work with this content. Uh, is one, it got us super excited, right? Because you know, so much of what we had been challenged by previously was you know, the, the lack of geographic literacy and just geographic awareness of the population writ large. And all of a sudden, almost seemingly overnight, you know, the population is now doing everything location-based. And, and all of a sudden, there's millions of people using location-based services, creating location, looking at maps, and looking at geography in a context. Um, so it became really interesting to us of, of how this becomes another data feed into you know, this uh, you know, larger data substrate that we were building out. And, but also in addition to it, having you know, spent way too much time doing geographic and nerdy things, what were the challenges that were going to come from all this new data that was coming in? Um, and there's been, there's been some really good research from geographers uh, in this area, which unfortunately hasn't gotten a ton of attention. But I think some really interesting policy issues on this. You know, not only around privacy, which has gotten most of it, but also I think probably even more importantly is bias. Um, because you know, as we've moved into big data and we've decided all questions can now be answered with big data, and you know, theory is dead and experts are dead, we just need data, right? Feed me data and I'll give you all the all-knowing answer. And as much as I love data and have spent way too much time in data, um, there's some serious issues and challenges when we look at the bias in our data. Um, and this is one of the things of you know, substance and authority uh, with this. So actually, I'm going to give a, a talk at a biosurveillance conference in Denver around people that want to use social media to do biosurveillance monitoring around threat risks for disease spread and so forth. And they're all excited about it, um, which, is, which is great. But, but again, the problem with you know, tapping into things like Twitter is it's such a small percentage of the population that's actually using Twitter. Um, and the people that are using Twitter um, are incredibly biased. You know, it's mostly white, mostly male, mostly high income, and, you know, and that accounts for a disproportionate amount of the traffic that happens. And especially if you look at the number of people that are doing it through a smartphone and they're providing GPS location and allowing place IDs. And again, you, know, you, you get down to this, the subset of the subset of the subset of something that's a very biased demographic already. Um, and then you also have people that are not necessarily tweeting things that are factual. They're putting, you know, intentionally or not intentionally putting false information into the stream as well. Um, and so this was just a demonstration that I, I pulled together for this where I put in health-related tweets. So you know, anybody that was tweeting about the flu um, or a cough or being or having an illness. Um, and again, you know, you have challenges with this as well. So I started off with saying, oh, I'll put ill and sick. And I began looking at the tweets. I'm like, I'm an idiot. You know, <laughs> such a sick jump I did off the half pipe, right? Or, you know. <laughs> and I thought I had a whole bunch of crappy tweets that did nothing about answering my question. But, but again, you know, if somebody just does a collection, they don't actually go through and look at the text of the tweet. They don't realize that they just, you know, put in something that's given them tons of bad data that's completely not relevant to what they want to look at. Um, so then, you know, cut it down to something that was a little bit better set of uh, semantics for collecting the data that I wanted, you know, and so you begin to get, you know, two days in the, in the flu, need to sweat it out for tomorrow. Um, 
but you know, as people as you begin to look at the geographic diffusion of these things, you get a lot of people that are tweeting about the you know having the flu, um, but um, or issues like the Arab Spring, right? That they're talking about the Arab Spring, but are they actually at the spot where the Arab Spring's happening, or are they tweeting from somewhere else, responding to a news story that they saw? Is the person actually sick? Are they talking about somebody else that's sick in a totally different place? Are they responding to a news story? Um, and so we spend a lot of time kind of you know diving into the different forms of location that are that are in a social media, right? You know, you have the location of the mobile device, um, you have the location of the GOIP address, um, you have the profile of where somebody said that they're from. So I say, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I live in Arlington, Virginia, but I'm tweeting from New York during the conference, right? And so, um, and then I also have where I'm talking about in the tweet itself. So I could be, you know, here talking about the Arab Spring, even though I'm from Arlington, right? So three different locations linked up. As to, as to the course of this information. Um, but if you can understand that and the differences between them, you can get a, you, know, you begin to get an idea of the substance and authority of the person that's speaking about a particular topic. Are they somebody that are there at the event? Are they reacting to the event from somewhere else? And all the information is valuable, but it answers very different questions. And if you conflate the information together, you get very different answers from the question they particularly, potentially you're trying to answer. Um, so that's you know, stuff that we're kind of popping around in. Um, and so then I, you know, I dug into it. You know, here's somebody in Brooklyn saying, you know, that his friend's flu is worse than his. I'm not a doctor, but I don't think it's good. And you know, somebody has a hashtag around Henrik um, in the Nyquil circle. Right? So He's talking about hockey player. <laughs> oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah. See, again, context is everything, right? Um, you know, I, I, I think Lundqvist is his friend. I have no idea. Um, but some of these things end up being subjective, that if you don't understand the context of the tweet that's, that's being pushed through, you can come to a completely irrelevant decision that's on it. Um, but there, there was a great piece by Mark Graham uh, from Oxford in The Guardian about the biases in big data, right? But so much of the data that we tap into is not a, a universal holistic census and we have no idea what the error margin is and what the bias of the data is. And yet we're, we're looking at it as the omnipotent answer to so many different things. And you begin to apply this to city and city services. Um, and, and again, you know, these ideas of divides between populations and the bias that you have in the sensors that you're monitoring and where you're getting the information from raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, a lot of interesting questions to be answered. Um, and, uh, but also a lot of negative things that can come from it, but also a lot of positive uh, uh, benefits that can come from these technologies. I think, you know, right now we're kind of in this love affair of being enamored by the technology, which is great because it creates a lot of adoption, it drives a lot of value for folks, um, but if we don't look at the fuller picture, there's definitely some challenges there. And so here's just playing around, right, with what are some techniques that we can begin to drive at bias in here. So it's just, you know, aggregating all of those tweets by state and then looking at the relationship between populations. So where are you getting more tweets than the population would predict? Um, so you know you see a huge number of tweets in California and New York, but that's actually fewer tweets than the population would predict about the flu. Um, so there's a lot of people tweeting about the flu, but it's actually fewer people than you would predict tweeting about the flu given the population of users in that particular location. Whereas Wisconsin, um, even though you know the number of tweets may not have been that big, it was way more than the population would predict, and so you're actually getting a, a higher percentage of people talking about the flu in, in Wisconsin, which means that really I maybe should be paying attention to Wisconsin. Um, it could also it could also be an indicator that you know that the bias that there is uh, you know more people on Twitter of a certain age group in Wisconsin than the other places. But again, you have to begin looking at the demographics and normalizing the data to really understand what's going on and provide the context around it. Um, so again, you're know, trying to provide simple tools. So you don't necessarily need to be a GIS person to dive in and begin to understand this stuff. But again, the, the other side of it is you know, matching these data worlds together. And, and oftentimes, as the new thing comes along and we get enamored with it, we forget about the old data, that you know, maybe the small data or the slow data. Um, it's not the big data and the fast and the real-time data. Um, but all of these things are, um, are useful from a context perspective. Um, so there's actually some stuff that we did for Pepsi uh, for the Oscars, which is fa the thing that fascinated me with Pepsi was that they they do a bunch of things called affinity mapping, where they know that if you like Justin Bieber, that you also like these Pepsi products. If you like Lady Gaga, you like these Pepsi products. You know, if you like the Black Swan, you like this stuff. You know, if you like the Avengers, you're going to like these Pepsi products. Um, so what's fascinating is they go through and they mine Twitter to see where people are talking about particular topics, and then they know that they'll like these particular products. So they'd actually go through 
for the Oscars and, and look at these areas and then they we'd plug into the Facebook API and they would target ads based on what people were saying on Twitter um, to certain demographics. You know, on Facebook you can say I want to hit 18 to 21 year olds with this ad in this location. So they monitor Twitter and say, hey, everybody's talking about Justin Bieber and Detroit or Eminem. Then I want to target these people ads at this time because that's what they're buzzing about as a major event's going on. Um, but what was interesting was that we really, for part of that project, we dug into understanding um, uh, margin of error and, and trying to put some parameters around how meaningful the data is. Um, so we'd say, you know, how many tweets do we have in New York for that 10 minute segment? You know, we had 2,000 tweets, um, you know, and, and the, for the population that gives us a margin of error of, you know, 7% and a 99% 99, uh, 99 confidence level. Uh, so, you know, similar to when you see a Gallup poll, right? You see a Gallup poll saying, uh, you know, Mitt Romney versus Santorum and then a plus or minus 5% uh, accuracy level. So basically do the same thing for Twitter. The interesting thing is when you do like a Gallup poll, right, is that it's, um, they, they, they do a random distribution. They'll call up people and, uh, and randomly distributed places, but you don't have any control over where people are tweeting. And so your margin of errors uh, sway massively depending on what geography you're in. I think I left some auto advanced stuff in there. Um, so, you know, within uh, nationally, it may be one thing. In New York, it may be another thing. In North Dakota, there may be three tweets, and your margin of error is like 50%, right? So you, you're always going to have this streaming margin of error. It's changing, it's dynamic, depending on the geography, the time, the number of people responding, the event, the context. Um, so beginning, and again, this is still really crude, but beginning to put some boundaries on that to understand, you know, how confident am I in the amount of data that I've collected based on the geography, based on the context, based on the event, based on the time, and then as that changes, I respond accordingly um, as it cuts across. Um, and, uh, and so this is all kind of, you know, the, the last bit here of where does this all drive the city? Um, and this is where I think it's really interesting, you know, taking understanding that there's going to be bias in the data and that we need to account for it and, um, and there's a lot of work to be done there. There's also a huge amount of opportunity. Um, so this is stuff we did with the New York City Marathon um, where they created a, a mobile app for the marathon. But actually, I, I've talked to a few people, they said the app was horrible. Um, but 33,000 people used the app. They sent 3.5 million messages over the course of the marathon to each other. And basically the way the app worked is as you walked into an area, it would send you a notification saying, you know, if there was a runner that you were tracking that was going to be coming by, but it also like send you a, you know, a discount for a foot long sub from Subway if you entered the Subway <laughs> area. Um, and so it's interesting, you can go through and see all the data for what promotions they were sending as people went into which areas. Um, so basically they're streaming all this data off and so what we were doing was one, not only plotting out where the people are, so you can see everybody along the green route of the marathon there. And so those are people firing events and messages and getting promotions and coupons to each other. Um, so it was interesting because it became a proxy for crowd monitoring. So they actually ended, FEMA ended up using this for in case there was a disaster, um, they could see where the people were. And you know, if you're you know, half a million people, you have you know 33,000 mobile devices that are actively being used. You know, you have a you know a decent sized sample of um, of the population uh, during the course of the event. Um, but then we were doing another kind of interesting thing was they wanted to dynamically analyze the data. So every 10 minutes, we would sum up the number of people in each census block, and then uh, create a new analysis against that to show the patterns changing over time. So here you can see as the marathon changes. Oops, um, where those patterns patterns go. So you can see, you know, along the route, they're in Brooklyn. They move out of Brooklyn. They come over to Central Park, um, and you see these kind of interesting patterns as people move around uh, in aggregate. Uh, and so we're kind of where we're moving with this now is this fascinating concept that is, as your data becomes dynamic and the data is updating dynamically then your analyses are no longer static. Because right? most of the time I do an analysis is after the fact. I'm doing a post-mortem, right? I'm trying to figure out why did the Arab Spring happen? Uh, why did this flu outbreak happen? You know, why, why is there underage drinking in 2011 that caused rent prices to go down? It's always after the fact that I try to figure out with an, with an, with an analysis. But what's fascinating here is as the data is streaming dynamically, I can have the analysis update as frequently as I want. And then once I see a pattern emerge or I detect a pattern or I hit a threshold, then I can take a proactive action against it. Um, so some of the things that we're playing around here is that, um, uh, especially after the, the most recent uh, event in Egypt where there was a riot in the soccer stadium and all of a sudden it got a very dense crowd activity um, and it resulted in a, in a lot of loss of life. Um, and these happen frequently that 
you know, that you get the calculation that all of a sudden that you know the number of people in an area is increased by 100 percent, or I calculate the number of people per square meter in the area and it goes above two people per square meter, send an alert and let folks know that I have a potential crowd issue and I need to get folks in there, safety personnel to, um, to help control the crowd and, and dissipate what's going on. Um, but you, you see this for you know a lot of uh, a lot of potential things within a city and within an urban area of of as you know dynamically where things are happening and where there's issues to be able to trigger automatic uh, alerts and notifications that help drive and, and solve some of these problems, especially as the city gets more automated, um, there's more urban infrastructure and, and more sensors put into place. Um, but I think that's, you know from from my perspective, I think there's. You know, a lot of what's being talked about with big data now is around batch analysis. You know, people use Hadoop and things like this to go back and look over these massive data troves to figure out what happened. Um, I think what we'll see going forward is is emerging into how does analysis itself become a dynamic, streaming, living concept that adapts and learns and, and begins to uh, not necessarily become predictive, but become uh, ad adaptively reactionary to things to be able to to help. Um, maximize efficiency or minimize impact um, as things change and morph. Um, and so that's kind of it, and interconnecting this data together and is kind of the, the future of where we've been spending time and we, we've been having a lot of fun playing with more interesting data. But probably longer than I should have gone, but it's, uh, if I get when I make too many slides, I always think I go through them quickly and I don't. Um, but thank you for the patience and uh, thanks for having me. Um, this, this is on. Uh, so yeah, well, th thanks. That was, that was fascinating. Um, I'll just kick off with uh, just two really quick questions, and then, and then we'll just open up for a general conversation. Um, my first question actually uh, goes back to the beginning of your talk, where you were showing um, the the early maps of the internet from the 1990s, where there were different attempts to kind of show what data would look like, and you were talking about the difficulty of uh, giving cartographic form to all of these these new kind of emerging immaterial geographies. And um, I guess I'm just curious. In some ways, this is kind of like digital geography 101, so it's not the most interesting question. But nonetheless, I'm curious about the um, the difficulty of finding new metaphors or new toponyms for discussing where data is or how it flows. And you use words like, for instance, flow and cluster and route uh, and there's tra trajectory and so on. And then you see Google coming up with like Google latitude and you kept talking about latitude and longitude um, and these competing um, sort of metaphoric systems for under understanding space. And then I thought it was interesting as well that one of the um, diagrams you showed almost had the pipes up in the sky and the data was almost like precipitation coming down onto the nation, which is, you know, now we're looking at things that are very much embedded beneath the street. So there's kind of this nice inversion of, of the spatiality of that. Um, but in any case, I guess I'm curious about that idea of that, that cartographic challenge and, and, and how um, geographers or people who study spatial information are coming up with new ways of, um, you, even, you even refer to weather, you know, the idea of internet weather, you know, so, um, what, what is the challenge of finding the, the accurate metaphor, or are we in a position where we're always going to have every two or three years we're going to have the the internet weather phase, and then we're going to have the you know the the geographic phase, or is it a constantly shifting thing, or, or how does how do we how do we actually discuss the spatiality of information? Yeah, no, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and uh, I think probably the most interesting thing that I, that I've seen is it's it's been. It's, it's definitely cyclical, as you said, right? In the 90s, there was a lot of interesting work done because there was new data. Um, and then we've kind of cycled back through it while all of a sudden, you know, geography and location has become central to a lot of the technology ecosystem, especially within, within startups and, and a lot of entrepreneurial activities. Um, and what's been fascinating is how much innovation has come out of people that don't have a geographic background or a cartographic background. And there's tons of people reimagining what the metaphors are for how you visualize space and time and location, um, and whether that's it with a traditional geographic praxis or it's um, or you go off in a totally new direction. Uh, but, you know, but you know, folks like Ben Fry and um, Nathan Yao at Floating Data, the Stamen folks, Mike McGursky, Tom Carden at uh, at Bloomio or Bloom.io, uh, uh, Ben Savegni. And all the, you know, hardly any of those folks have a, a formal geographic or cartographic uh, background. Uh, but, but coming at it with a, with a design aesthetic um, and information and then doing a lot of education and collaboration with folks that have worked in that space, 
um, has created just a ton of new work. Um, and that was a tempting thing, is going through and looking at stuff in the 90s and seeing how much of that now is being re-envisioned yet again in the last two years, even in the last year, uh, specifically with folks doing just lots of fascinating information visualization around, around location and content and networks. Um, you know, and, and social media fostering a lot of that as more social media gets a location and time component attached to it. Um, you know, folks really spending a lot of time thinking about what that looks like. You know, even like the, you know, I think one of the, the coolest things I saw last year was the, the Facebook graph um, that one of their interns did in R. And it's, you know, it's just like new arcs of people's, people's friend connections around the globe. And it was, you know, just fascinating insight of looking at, you know, what one visualization within Facebook. Um, but but the, the thing that's really encouraging, I think, is how many of this is not coming from the traditional channels and how many people are really re-envisioning and rethinking um, how we do this kind of work. And, and, the, and the cool thing is, as they engage with it, they learn and become curious, and then they dig into a lot of the old texts and things that people have done in the past, but they're coming out with a completely fresh perspective, new tools, new ideas, uh, new capabilities as well. Um, and then uh, my second question is actually uh, quite quite brief, I guess. But when you were when you were showing the um, the latter part of the presentation, you were talking about the potential inaccuracies in these data sets. Um, it just reminded me of um, you know the ha having just re only recently moved to New York from from California. Um, one, one thing I think is really fascinating about water in the American Southwest is that it's all based on. Um, Statistical gathering of, of 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 water flowing down the Colorado River during a particularly um, wet series of years, and so the entire water economy of the West is based on a bad data set, which is why you know now states are going into these conflicts over who's using too much water from their compact and if they have to sue the ne the next state, et cetera. But they're all based on uh, unrealistic expectations for water. So in any case, I'm using that as a as an anecdote to say, surely this is just the problem not of 21st century mobile data gathering, but literally just of data itself, and that there's something, you're, you're always going to have a biased or an inflected or, a, or a, um, a, an unevenly weighted data set, and you know, that seems to be kind of like the ontology of data, I guess you could say, that it's, it's always slightly wrong, it's always skewed. So, you know, is it, or, or is, it, is it really that we are discovering a kind of a new errorism of data, or are we just simply constantly rediscovering the, the problem of, of statistical measurement itself? Yeah, no, it's exactly right. The, um, and it always fascinates me when I get into a room of like old school academics or GIS folks with a whole bunch of people that are doing new location-based technologies, and there's this perception that the old data was without fault and it, you know, completely perfect, and because experts did it, and they spent a lot of time calculating margin errors and these other things, but you know, the reality is, is all data is shit, right? You just, you're, you're trying to figure out how shitty is it. Um, and uh, and, the and, the, and what's fascinating, and I, I think it's another area that's ripe for a lot of research and innovation, is this concept that, that the error margin and the accuracy of data is completely fluid. Um, because it's, it's not something where we do a census every 10 years and we, we go out and we calculate the number of our sample size and, and we know what the probabilities are and we go through and, and do these things, that it's, it's much more evolving into something like Twitter where the census is perpetual and streaming and the amount of error in it is going to be fluctuating wildly. Um, and so how, how do we go from that standard? Because so much of data analysis and science is built around this concept of of, of we know what the sample size is, we know what the error of margin is, we know we have a pretty good rationale around the accuracy of it. Um, and the problem with that is even then, a lot of times it was still wrong, right, to, to, your, to your example. And I, I think that happened a ton, right? We have these data sets that we think are completely accurate, when in reality there's all sorts of fallacies around it. But since it was set and the experts moved on to their next project, there's really nobody back looking to see if it's right or if it's wrong. Um, so while, while there is, this risk of new data sources being fluid and dynamic and, and evolving, potentially putting us in erroneous directions. There's also a huge potential in that it's no longer the static thing we create once and leave, that really the data is living and it's growing and it's changing. And in order to harness the potential of that, we have to kind of redefine our concept of what right and wrong and accuracy and error is. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. And, and I think it's really an opportunity for us to move past a lot of the mythology historically speaking, that, that our data was so great. Um, and it was also something we were talking about with, uh, Anthony, we were talking about with open data coming from governments. Um, as these things get pushed out, right, is how much of the data is good, how much of the data is bad. But also I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity for governments 
that hasn't been taken uh, advantage of nearly enough is that as you push the data out and make it open, there's the opportunity to improve the data. Because um, once you fuse the static and the dynamic together, there's that ability to begin to understand, okay, this is the average rent from uh, 2010, and we can do it every year. Um, but you also have people talking about you know, what the rent is across Craigslist, people you know, tweeting or posting on Foursquare of you know, various bits of information that are updating that in, in a real time that's not as cohesive of a census as what you get when you go and do that with uh, you know, full government effort. Um, but there's the ability to fuse those two things together, um, which is, is something that I think we'll probably see more of uh, going forward. Um, well, let's take a, f a couple questions from the audience. Anthony, did you still have your question? You wanna yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask, like, so one of the things that really struck me, again, listening to this, is just how hard it is to make geographic data, like, useful to everyday people. Um, and it gets harder once you introduce all these real-time issues. So if there's sort of, like, kind of a, a, like, a, like a data arms race or an analytical arms race going on about who, who can figure out how to use real-time data better, faster? Mm -hmm. Who wins in that world? Is it, is it big corporations that have proprietary algorithms? Is it open data communities that can put many eyes on the problems? Like, how is the balance of power shifting, basically, mm -hmm. as we go from static to real time? Yeah, I think it's interesting because you, you, you see a lot of this in the you know the data scientist wars. Of, you know, so many startups and corporations are trying to hire data scientists, but the the supply of data scientists is incredibly small, and so you, know, you get this war for talent of who's going to get somebody that knows statistics, modeling, can write code, um, and also handle you know big clusters of computing infrastructure. Right, and there's you know, one in a hundred thousand maybe that actually have those skill talents. Um, and and I, I think that's where the you know the community approach and the democratization of the data is 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 where there's opportunities for for wins so to speak. Um, that I, I think a lot of large corporations are going to try to suck up talent, but I think it's it's a bit of a Sisyphean task because you're never going to be able to keep up with the talent that you have unless you really go and you. Know, once as you attack the root cause of educating enough people to be data scientists, right? So now college programs are about putting these things into place, but it's going to take time, and people don't like to do math. Um, and you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's going to be a challenge on that side, right? But, but I think that's where there is, there is potential for how do you democratize the ability to do these things and, and provide more of a collaborative framework so that you don't need to have all the expertise sitting in one person. Um, that you know, you, you know urban science really well. I know geographic modeling really well you know R really well, and somebody else can write Python, right? And, and the ability that we can all collaborate and work together in a, in a framework and a technology uh, milieu that allows these things to interconnect, I think, is, is the way that we're going to have to scale to do that. You know, it's, you know, the, I think the technology is going to get better as far as making these things more accessible and more easy. You know, I shouldn't have to write pig to use Hadoop. And I think we'll see more startups, you know, abstracting that away to where there's a more simple user interface, I mean, similar to what we did for kind of geographic analysis. But you know, for, for all these things, it's going to require um, a little bit of democratization around accessibility. But I think even more importantly is allowing people with multiple backgrounds and expertise to collaborate more fluidly around the data and around a, a topical area. Um, and I think that's that's where there's going to be a lot of opportunity to change, hopefully. Matt? Um, as, you, as you were talking, I got a, uh, an email about Google Wave being turned off. It's kind of ironic, but it reminded me too that um, sometimes as these technologies evolve, we find out that some of them maybe don't work as well um, or don't catch on. And in this field of, of, uh, of social media technology, are there, are there techniques or methodologies or products that have sort of that haven't caught on like that, or have, have uh, are there accidents and failures that have led to um, new innovations and so on? Yeah, and no, that's one of the interesting interesting things is how fluid um, fluid that market is. Like you know, we showed that graphic with all of the purely mobile based social services. How many of those are gone now? Um, and same thing with uh, Anthony and I were talking about before before we came up was just the. Uh, you know, the number of venture-backed companies that were doing kind of geo-analytics and uh, uh, geo-data work, like Simple Geo is gone. Um, 
and you know subtler startups that have kind of you know popped up and popped back down again. Uh, but the the interesting thing is the the innovation typically gets picked up and taken <coughs> in a new direction, or it's or it was a you know it wasn't an idea that was the right time or the right place, right, and didn't have a market, so it fizzles out and goes away. Um, but but I think overall the you know the amount of focus of folks that are coming in and looking at um, the location-based side of things, whether it's through social media, whether it's through big data, whether it's through sensors, is bringing in a lot of new expertise and perspectives that's creating, is making a much more thriving ecosystem than you do traditionally. Because traditionally, if you talk about geographic analysis and data, it was ESRI and the GIS companies. And the amount of innovation within that industry, while you know, lots of very passionate people that have built some great software, but you know, from an innovation curve, it's been fairly stagnant. You know, it hasn't been you know these big jumps of, of concepts and technology. And it's kind of stagnant because it's a bit of a monopoly, also. Um, but that's where I think, you know, to your point of these companies, some will fizzle out and some will make it uh, and go forward. Um, but it's all going to be great for the industry itself. Um, but it's really invigorating a lot of innovation ideas, you know, the number of young people bringing in completely new concepts around doing things like map projections um, is awesome to see. Because um, people are going in and looking, looking at stuff that has been considered, you know, a solved problem and looking at it from new opportunities, new concepts with new data, new sources coming into it, new techniques and computational opportunities and really reinventing things, but still, you know, building out the framework of what was there before. Okay. We'll continue next. Yeah, all right. Um, okay, I mean, I appreciate, I like the presentation very much, but I'm going to provoke you a little bit. If it's okay, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, if I look at it from the outset, you have presented what to me seems the history of data, and the history of data in a specific practice, mm -hmm. and uh, to me, uh, there's something uh, totally new that is facing us, and it's not so much the amount of data, but it's the way in which data is processed. So, for example, when you talk about we all produce location-based data, for me what is more interesting is that location-based has become a system to filter the data that reaches us. So the body is becoming the center. The mm -hmm. ocean of data was already present. Mm -hmm. So I don't find particularly interesting the evolution of graphic representation of information because I, I find it like Web 1.0, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think we're entering Web 2.0. Web 2.0 is Google Earth. Google Earth is an algorithm that uses data associated in a seamless way and presents the world in a way that we didn't used to see. Mm -hmm. It's not a map. It's a different representation. So I'd like you to engage with the future. Where is representation of geographic information systems going to be in 10 years from now? Because this is not going to be it. This is mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. What, what is going to be tomorrow? Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the most fascinating things, and you know, as much as much as I love maps, is the uh, is the relegation of the map to not being important. Um, potentially, is that you know, there's. I think that's really when when location and you know, spatial analysis and, and the things that kind of sit at the back end of this that are doing the number crunching and computation are truly going to become useful to the entire public. And uh, is when a map's no longer needed for it, um, because the, the the number of us that that use a map as our as our reference point up until Google Earth, and you know getting Google Maps on your phone for, for doing directions, you know the number of times that the majority of us looked at a map in the course of a day was was quite small. Um, and I think what will be interesting is as um, as this evolves. Does the map fade away and become less of the interface with how people interact with the data coming off of sensors? That's you know still going to be location driven and temporally driven and, and have lots of rich statistical attributes that go to it. But how do we deliver that into a way that that is meaningful and helps somebody solve a common problem or do an action or do a task or um, you know, a variety of other things that create value? Um, so it, right to a certain extent, there's a limited amount of value in seeing my data represented two-dimensionally on a map. Um, like I love it because I'm a geographer, right? But you know, my mom, my dad, my girlfriend less interested in seeing two-dimensional data on a map, right? But there's all sorts of location information that's coming off of devices and sensors and people that's incredibly valuable. But 
how do we take that information and make it meaningful and useful to solve a problem and answer a question for the vast majority of us. And I don't think necessarily the map is the answer for that. I think because so much geographic data has emerged, it's relevant. We put it on a map because that's what we've always done. And so now we get tons of people that are looking at using it maps. But I think the number of things that the vast majority of us can do with that map is quite limited. Um, and I think it's be fascinating to see how that evolves and, and how people move away from it or does or does the sector itself kind of die off, right? You know, we have a lot of location-based apps that are doing things on the mobile device that end up on a map, right? But none of them are doing super well. So I, see, I think this is a question for urban design to answer. I don't think it's, you know, it's like urban designers have always been about like summarizing and filtering and highlighting bits of information about what's around you. And like all the legibility projects that are going on all around the world right now are like, they're taking this copious spatial data and trying to you know, compute walking times and put that on a sign. I don't know, it's just a really interesting, like I don't know if all the skill set to do that is in the tech community or, the, or even in the geography Um, let's, let's, let's go ahead and, and there's a, are you in the red, are you going to reply to that or, or we'll go to the question? No, okay, cool. Okay. Let's go to you first. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, but I read an interesting piece today on employers asking potential employees for their Facebook login information so that they go and see their profiles. And I read the book, The Net Delusion, um, uh, I can't remember the, the author's name, but, but how uh, governments are becoming more and more savvy in using technologies that supposedly liberate people um, in terms of sending out information and so on. Um, and it sort of gets to your point about data being skewed or, or insufficient in some ways. So I'm not exactly sure the question, but, but somehow this has to impact um, the data that we use. You know, if we know that people are going to use it for repressive means, mm -hmm. might that shift how people represent that and represent themselves and so on. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a fascinating question and, um, and I think to a certain degree I've gotten a little bit cynical about it having worked in with with folks in the intelligence community um, and not, you know, there's a lot of very hardworking, you know, patriotic folks in that, but I, I would say after spending, you know, several years through the course of our startup, my fear level of the government successfully mining data to come up with really insightful things about me is about that. <laughs> just the, the competency level is, is, is not, you know, it's, it's, it's the people that aren't working at Foursquare and Google and so forth, right? Not, not that there aren't very, very smart people working there, but, but the extent to which that, you know, that they're mining data to be, have like a, a repressive big brother presence over what we're doing. You know, the majority of folks that I've had meetings and sit down with, like, my confidence in their ability to go do that is is not massive. Um, and I, I don't know if that says good things or bad things about our national security, but um, so that's kind of one side of it is is just kind of my somewhat cynical thoughts on the ability of the government to live up to the expectations that people have given around their big brother capabilities. Um, but the the other one at a, at a more meaningful level is. Um, uh, you know, is what's that trade-off between privacy, openness, mm -hmm. and security, and that and that's something that's, that's definitely over the course of the work we've been trapped in the middle of. And so, you know, I, I've always felt very strongly about about open data um, and that being more important than security. Um, I think it's it's a very kind of ostrich head in the sand thought that um, that by hiding data that somehow we're going to increase security. Um, and on the, on the privacy side, privacy side also, I, I think it's um, uh, it, it's, it's another interesting challenge. You know, I generally think you know the benefits of having more data open, if people are are willing to provide the data to being open, is uh, greater than you know the, the privacy concerns that come off the backside of it. But but generally speaking, I, I think there's a lot more to be concerned about with the companies that are collecting the data. You know, Facebook. Right. Twitter, whoever. Um, I have a lot more worries about them invading my privacy and knowing a lot of detailed things about me than I do the government. Oh, yeah. Um, for, for what it's worth from that perspective. Yeah. Let's just do one, one more question in, in the front. Um, so, just to kind of tag off of that, um, the, the, the first half of your response, I'm not so concerned about the, 
incompetence of the government to, to get their surveillance right. I'm concerned about the unintended consequences of them getting wrong. Mm -hmm. So, like, there, there was the case in point of the two Brits who flew out to L.A. about a month ago, and one guy tweeted how they were going to destroy L.A., which meant they were going to be drunk all week. <laughs> and nobody understood that, um, and or nobody had a sense of humor to understand that all the security, maybe they can't access from the dictionary or something like that, and they wound up getting deported. Um, so that, that's kind of a farcical example, but, you know, it, it's much more the unintended consequences. Um, the question I wanted to ask was about, um, the, the, at, at the beginning of your presentation, the, the geographic basis, which I think is great, how it illustrates that the, the, the disparities, like the technology just kind of reinforces uh, gaps of, of wealth, of uh, economic prosperity, of uh, connectivity, and things like that. And, and the, the, the graph of smartphone growth versus non-smartphone growth. And, and from the point of view of, of the kind of richness that's being created via mapping or post-mapping, Whereas you know, in, in developing countries, you're not you're not having the kind of infrastructure, you know, like via that photograph of the sea cable, you know, the mm -hmm. East Africa sea cable. Uh, you don't have that kind of infrastructure. You're, you're you're still stuck with SMS as your you know information substrate, right? Um, so so what what kind of technology or what kind of way forward can you see that that will that will close that gap? Or, or is it just you know these are these are trajectories that once they get set into motion, it's pretty you know, it's pretty irrelevant. Um, yeah, and I, I think you know how do you how do you get the rest of you know the eighty percent of the world connected to meaningful information infrastructure is a, is a fascinating question. Um, although my my guess is that we'll see that gap close a lot more quickly than we would expect given the trajectory that we've been on for the last two decades. Um, and you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things around, you know, microsatellites, uh, low Earth orbit constellations that you know a lot of folks are pushing up. But you also you just look at how quickly things are on drones and DIY um, has pushed up. So, so the ability to launch, you know, cheap, fast disposal communication networks with aerostats and, and things along these lines to to find ways to provide in connectivity to. Uh, to populations um, that happens much more quickly than having to build out telco infrastructure. Um, I, I, I think you know, if, if there's an opportunity and there's a market and the, and the cost curves get low enough, which I think we're seeing, and, and, you have an, and you're going to have lots of indigenous innovation around this, that people will find ways to solve this problem in a variety of different markets that will create a lot of opportunity. I mean, there, there's still going to be divides, but I think we're going to see a lot of micro divides and uneven development um, as you know, different places, like you know, Kenya is a great example of like, you know, they're hopping on to these opportunities much faster than a lot of the rest of Africa. But I think as, as people find successes, they'll get replicated in different areas. You know, it's kind of the classic William Gibson quote of, you know, the future's here, it's just not distributed very evenly. <laughs> Cool, thanks, Sean. That was fascinating. Thank you. Okay. And um, yeah, thanks for everyone for coming out. Um, the, the next uh, installment in the X City series is actually three weeks from tonight. It's on uh, Tuesday, April 10th. Uh, it's at 6.30. I've totally blanked on uh, who's, who's speaking that evening. But, um, <laughs> IBM's Guru Bonabar is going to discuss the Rio de Janeiro project. So they're uh, their big brother down, their big brother in the Southern Hemisphere. All right, cool. So if you want to hear the Brazilian big brother, uh, come, come in here on uh, April 10th. Uh, but cool, thanks.